Shalom, shalom. Dave Lamez here. <clears throat> we are dealing with Daniel warned us about Christianity part three. Just a quick recap. The last slide we did in the last lecture was we see Jesus and Paul speaking about lawlessness. Does, doesn't this mean someone breaking the law? If you're a lawless person, right? And we talked about how isn't the Antichrist identified as a lawbreaker? The person who was lawless is revealed, who is headed for destruction. Second Thessalonians 2 and 3, a very common um, Bible verse the Christians talk about with um, concerning the Antichrist. So if you are no longer required to keep the law, how would you recognize the Antichrist? And we went over many verses of the New Testament saying you don't have to keep the law anymore. You're not under the law. You're under grace. The law was weak and useless. There's a change of the law, Hebrews 7, 12, Hebrews 7, 18. So just a quick recap. So let us continue. If you're a lawless person and you break that law willingly, you only get one shot with Jesus. So you only get one chance with Jesus. You might want to keep the law or you will be called lawless. Correct? We see Jesus and Paul speaking about lawlessness. Doesn't this mean someone breaking the law? 1 John 3 and 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. That means breaking the law. We already established Luke 16, 17, Matthew 5, Matthew 23. Jesus is all about telling people you have to keep the law. He tweaks it. He changes it. He gives new commandments, all types of things. He breaks the laws, but that's, for, that's another lecture. Actually, uh, shout out to Tanakh Talk, Isaiah 53, 9, part 2. Um, uh, Tanakh Talk, you can go on that YouTube page and you see all the things that Jesus did to, to break the law. But Matthew 24 and 12, and because lawlessness will, re will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness will abound. What does that mean? I mean, people are not going to be keeping the law anymore. Well, who's promoting that? Romans 4 and 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. People are sinning because they are lawless. But if somebody's telling you you're not under the law and the, the law was weak and useless, Hebrews 7 and 18, then it doesn't make any sense that he would tell you to be keeping the law in Romans 2, 13. Not the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law will be righteous. So we see the, you know, the flip-flopping in the New Testament. But somebody's changing the times and laws. So you only get one chance with Jesus. You might want to keep the law or you will be called lawless. Correct? So I'm going to keep asking this question. Matthew 19, 16 through 17. Now behold, one came, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things should I do, shall I do that I may, may inherit eternal life? This is a very... Simple question, but eternal life is on the table with the questions. And so it says, so he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. No one is good but one. That is God. So we see Jesus not identifying as God here. He's saying, why do you call me good? Only God is good. If he was God, I think he would have been like, yep, you came to the right person, right? But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, we see in Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin will, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no, longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So if you get baptized and you willfully commit a sin. Now, see, it doesn't say if the sin is worthy of death, if you got to pay a fine, if you're going to be cut off. It just says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So that one shot with Jesus, after you receive the knowledge of their truth, that's it. That's it. But the Tanakh doesn't teach that. Again, we got changing of times and laws. So if you do what is lawful and right, what happens? Ezekiel 18, 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right he shall surely live he shall not die 
So we see you get another chance if you repent in the Tanakh. But in Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So we see a difference with doctrine in Hebrews concerning sins. Again, the changing of law that we see in Daniel 7, 25. And there's so many other examples of repentance in the Tanakh. It's all over the Tanakh. You can repent. Look at Nineveh. The whole city repented and got saved. Read Jonah 3, 1 through 10. All right? It's right there. <laughs> it's right there. So Titus, Paul, and the Roman church. Because I've been on Rome's head because this is their they they keep coming up. Why does Rome keep coming up when we're dealing with these same verses and topics concerning somebody changing the law? Right? Daniel 7 25. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. I showed you, and I want to say part one, how Titus spoke against the most high in the oral tradition and what happened to him. Paul being a Roman, right? Again, Titus and Paul, both Romans, Acts 22 and 25. As they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who was a Roman and uncondemned? Shall persecute, um, sorry. Remember, it says he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Titus destroyed the second temple, and Paul cursed anyone that disagreed with him in Galatians 1, 8-9. So this led to persecution. The church used this. If you don't think the church used this verse in the Inquisitions, you're asleep. Paul said, if you don't agree with me, you are cursed. So this could justify any abuse that the church would have on anybody who disagreed with them. They'll say you're cursed, you're condemned, you're going to hell, you don't believe. That's where the persecution can start right there. Just simply because you don't agree. It was the Roman Catholic Church. Look it up. And other denominations, not only Romans, but the Roman Church had majority of the power for a long time. Once Christianity became the state religion. And shall intend to change times and law. So let's deal with this B.C. and A.D., were created by Roman Christians. So we see in the historian's hut, Dionysus and Bede, the monks who created the B.C. and A.D. style of dating years. Y'all can check that link out. Ancient and medieval Christian clergy had a dire problem that, need, that, <clears throat> that they needed to solve. The churches of different regions could not decide on how to calculate the date of their holy day of Easter or Ishtar. It was only around 525 A.D. C.E. when a monk named Dionysus, Dion, Dionysus, Dionysius, I don't really don't know how to say that, Dionysius, is exequus, exequus, 470 through 544 A.D. C.E. proposed a data system that could be standardized through throughout the various regional churches. This is when the church had power, right? Regional churches. Who set up the church? Did Israel set up the church? Or did Paul and Jesus set up these churches? He argued that dates after the birth of Jesus should be labeled as Anno Domini or in the year of our Lord. So see that they made Jesus their God, right? Doesn't Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 16 say, don't worship nothing that looks like a man. And even in Romans 1, 23, it says you have change the image of the living God from a creature or you have changed the glory of the, the image of God into a man or like a four footed creature or something. So even the book of Romans disagrees with doing this, but it says <clears throat> in the year of our Lord using scripture and other sources he had available to him. What scriptures did he use? I think I showed you Colossians two sixteen, Hebrews seven twelve, right? Dionysius basically made an educated guess as to where 1 AD should be placed on the timeline. 
Dionysius never claimed that this designation of 1 AD was precisely the year that Jesus was born, and the date of Jesus' birth remains highly debated. But Dionysius kept it with his system and started what would become a Western tradition. So, anybody solo scriptura, uh, you know, Bible only, we don't go outside the Bible if it's not in the book then you got a problem with using the dating system. So if you don't like traditions, you only want to use what the Bible says, you can't use these dates because they're bogus according to how you rock. I got a whole video of why is the oral tradition rejected by Jews and Christians. So we see it's a Western tradition. It's not scripture. He used some scripture to try to justify it, but it doesn't say to do that. It just talks about how the law can be changed, which exactly that's exactly what Daniel's talking about. So again, if we continue, even though Dionysius began the use of AD for the years after Jesus' birth, he did not develop the use of BC for the years prior to Jesus. In fact, Dionysius rather wanted to exclude Roman figures like Julius Caesar and Nero from his timeline. It would take another monk with an obsession for finding a standardized day for Easter to bring the use of BC into the Western world. Excuse me. So we see somebody else, a, another uh, another person who was a monk, it says he had an obsession for finding a standardized date. Because we it says Dionysus never claimed that his designation of 1 AD was precisely the year Jesus was born. So these are guesses. They're guessing on when to do these things. The reason they have to guess because Matthew and Luke don't agree when Jesus was born. Look it up. Scholars argue about it today. There's a seven-year gap that is just up for debate. So if we continue this, we see in worldhistory.org, there's an article, Dionysus invented the concept of Anno Domini in the year of our Lord in an attempt to stabilize the date of the celebration of Easter. At the time he was working on this problem, Christians of the influential church of Alexandria were dating events from the beginning of the reign of the Roman emperor Diocletian. 284 CE, who persecuted members of the new faith. Dionysius was seeking to bring the Eastern and Western churches into agreement on a single day in which all Christians would celebrate Easter. So we see they were even beefing among themselves when to celebrate Easter. Because it was a tradition. It was not nothing found in the book. So basically, who usually gets to tell people what to do, the, per the person who wins the war, right? And it says, <clears throat> he wanted to start it from the reign of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. So who backed him up on this decision? Roman Emperor Diocletian era. Who had the power in this era? We continue... This goal had been decided upon by Constantine the Great at the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, but had not yet been met. Toward this end, Dionysus changed the system of dating years from the Roman system and the Alexandrian system to his own in which his present Christian era dated from the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. His choice also eliminated another problem he found troubling, dating events from the reign of an emperor who had killed so many Christians. Hmm. Interesting. So it says his choice also eliminated a problem he found troubling. He wanted to get rid of some history. Why? It happened. You know, we're supposed to learn from history. Let's continue. <clears throat> Worldhistory.org. B.C. and A.D. in the Bible, Jesus' birth. The only problem with this data system was that no one knew when Jesus of Nazar Nazareth was born. Dionysius himself did not know when Jesus was born, and his system makes no claims at dating that event definitively. 
He seems to have arrived at his calculations through a reliance on scripture and known history of the time to create a Christian calendar, which would be acceptable to both the Western and Eastern churches of the time and harmonizing the celebration of Easter. You see, everything is around Easter. Again, they changing the times in the law. They're changing the calendar to accommodate Easter, which is changing the law. Easter ain't in the Tanakh. What has usurped Easter? I mean, what has you what has Easter usurped or taken over? Passover. Look at the Jewish calendar, look at the holidays, and you see where the Christians put theirs on top of it. Easter is celebrated instead of Passover. Not all Christians do this. Some Christians celebrate Passover. But even in some King James Bibles, instead of saying Passover, it says Easter. Look it up. It literally says Easter in the New Testament instead of Passover. Ishtar. Who is Ishtar? Look it up. Daniel 7.25, again, this is very clear who's responsible for this. So just side note, you know, I'm, I'm on, this is my third video. So in part two, somebody sent a, um, a video or a, a comment. And instead of addressing, you know, the calendar, the Romans, all they said was Jesus is Lord. Well, that doesn't change anything. Just because you say that, that doesn't mean that the Romans still didn't change the calendar. And the Romans was Christians when they did it. So if you want to say Jesus is Lord and he's the Lord that they pray to, then you're basically confirming my argument that Daniel warned us of Christianity. If Jesus is the Lord of Christianity and the Romans were the Christians who changed the, the times and the law, then that should give you your answer of who is Jesus the Lord of? The beast who changed the times and laws the fourth beast. We see there is no Tanakh authority or New Testament authorization concerning the new way of dating history. The Roman Christians had the power to make this change, and Paul the Roman gave the fuel to encourage this change by claiming his inspiration from Jesus, Galatians 1, 11 to 12. The Hebrew calendar has given the Jews the means to celebrate their feast days over the last 3,500 years. So this new dating system has not hindered these observances, but have only shed light about what Daniel had to tell us. The last beast, Rome, a.k.a. Edom, has been the last and most vicious of the beasts and has morphed its power into the political and religious affairs around the globe for centuries. Jesus was given the chance to condemn the Roman rule. But what did he say? What did he think of the Roman tax collectors? Matthew 22, 17, 17 through 22. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. I don't know why he was so mad that they asked this question. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And God to the and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So he's basically saying, Yeah, pay the tax, right? So what did he think of the Roman tax collectors, right? He eats with them, but what are his thoughts? Matthew 9 and 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? What's a publican? In the Helps Word Studies 5057, Talonis, a publican, a tax collector, gathering public taxes from the Jews for the Romans. So Jesus is eating with these people. But guess what he thinks about them? Matthew 18, 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. This is somebody who disagrees with you, right? You got a problem. Something jumped off. And somebody who's supposedly a Christian don't want to listen to the congregation, right? But it says, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. So go tell on him. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. So a Gentile and a Roman tax collector are in the same category. 
to Jesus. So as he's eating with them, right? This is why, why does your master eat with the publicans and the sinners? So sinners and tax collectors are in the same bunch of people to the, to these, you know, the, we let the new Testament tell it, right? This is their version of events. But he says like a heathen, right? Well, what does Jesus think of the heathen? So, a heathen is a uh, another way to way to say Gentile, or somebody of another nation, a non-Jew, right? But doesn't he call these people dogs? So he eats with them, but what does he think of them? He's basically saying, treat them like a heathen and a tax collector. That's, you know, that's his thoughts, right? So how did Jesus really feel about non-Jews? Do not go into the way of the Gentiles or the heathen, right? These are his words. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Who is he talking about? A Gentile or a heathen. Let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Why does he think of them like this, right? Leviticus 19.34 says, The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So you're not allowed to call people dogs if you're not an Israelite, if they're not an Israelite. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Don't mess with them. They're dogs. It says in 1 Kings 4.34, kings from around the earth will come here at Solomon speak. He didn't call them dogs. He married their, their children. He, he wasn't supposed to marry all those foreign wives, but he did it. He didn't think they were dogs. Right? How are you going to be a light to the Gentiles if you're telling your disciples, don't go the way of the Gentiles? So now we got a problem. We know Israel is not known to proselytize or go out and be missionaries. So actually, when Jesus says don't go to the way of the Gentiles, would actually be something that Israel would have supported because that's not what they did to begin with. In 1 Kings chapter 8, it says the foreigners would come to them and because they heard about God's name. But then what happens? Go out and preach. Go out and preach, right? Go out and preach. Why? Because they're changing times and laws. So we can see this even in the Gospels. It's not just Paul and Titus. It's even in Jesus' own, his own message. If, if, the, if Christianity were not missionary, that's exactly how Israel was to begin with. But what happened? They changed how they did things. Calling people dogs. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you. You should love him as yourself. You don't call him a dog because he's not a Jew. That's changing the law also. Leviticus 19, 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your brother and not bear sin because of him. Proverbs 26, 24 through 26. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. So if God so loved the world, right? John 3, 16. Luke 14, 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even and as his and, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Excuse me. Um, hate your mother and your father? You can't be Jesus' disciple unless you hate your mother and your father. So if your mother and your father don't, you know, agree with this doc this new doctrine, right? This new doctrine of drink my blood, eat my flesh, 
um, pray, ask things in my name, John 14, right? All this new stuff, you're supposed to hate them? I think we read in 1 John, he who hates his brother is like a murderer, right? And there is no light in him. I think we read that in 1 John, 1st or 2nd John. So, again, what does Jesus think about people who disagree with him, who don't accept his gospel? It says you're supposed to hate them. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. Go back and read that Proverbs and compare it to the New Testament. So, going back to how Jesus felt about that question, right? Whose image is on the, on the coins, right? It was a Roman image, of course. Well, let's fast forward it to 2023. Whose image and language are on the U.S. dollar? It said, he said to them, whose image and inscription is this, right? So if you go to onlinelibrary.wiley.com, it says three Latin phrases, namely, Anuit Soeptis, or Coeptis. He has approved our undertakings Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages, and E Pluribus Unum, of out of many, one. That's Latin. Who speaks Latin in America? Who speaks Latin in Europe? We know the U.S. dollar, you know, has a lot of basically European, you know, um, history on it the 13 uh arrows the the eagle did the romans use an eagle eagle for their symbol just asking you know the stars the pyramid where are those words all these latin words where are they on the on the dollar right well think about it in the time of jesus the Roman images was on the money. Today, whose images and whose language is on the money? Is it not Rome? Latin, Luke 23 and 38. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. John 19 and 20. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Interesting. What calendar does the U.S. and Europe use? These are known historically as Christian nations, right? If you go further and further back, they weren't, but, you know, you know recently, they're Christian nations. So in the Britannica, if you look up Gre Gre Gregorian calendar, it says Gregorian calendar, also called new style cal calendar, solar dating system now in general use. It was proclaimed in 1582 by Pope Gregory VIII as a reform of the Julian calendar. Where do the popes get their power from? What language do the popes speak? The Gregorian calendar differs from the Julian only in that no century year is a leap year unless it is exactly divisible by 400, 1600, and 2000. A further proposed refinement, the designation of years evenly divisible by 4000 as common, not leap years, would keep the Gregorian calendar accurate to within one day and 20,000 years. Some, some pretty good math right, going on here, right? You know? got to give people they're smart people in the world within a year the change had been adopted by the italian states what language do the italians speak portugal spain and the roman catholic german states roman catholic german states gradually the other centuries adopted the gregorian calendar calendar the Pro protestant german states in 1699 great britain and its colonies in 1752 
Sweden in 1753, Japan in 1873, China in 1912, and the Soviet Socialist Republics in 1918, and Greece in 1923. Islamic countries tend to use the Gregorian calendar for secular life, but retain calendars based on Islam for religious purposes. So we see definitely a major influence with this new times and laws changes, right? So who speaks Latin? Romaicoes, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Latin from Romaeus, Romaic, i.e. Latin, see Greek, Romaeos, Romaisti, usage in the Latin language. Roman numerals, right? Roman numerals are on the money. Roman numerals are used to count the Super Bowl. Latin is deciphered when doctors give prescriptions. I bet y'all didn't know that. What language is the creepy music in the Exodus movies using? Yeah, I know the creepy music that nobody knows the words, but it just sounds terrifying. Who has their own book in the New Testament? And what does it say to do? Yep, I asked the question. Who has their own book <laughs> in the New Testament? We're going to get to it. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The times and laws have changed. Caesar's New Testament is the fulfillment of Daniel 7.25, and Jesus co-signed it. I'm not saying Julius Caesar wrote the New Testament. The Caesar represents Rome. Before I get anybody in the comments saying anything, I'm trying to I'm kind of being funny, but when I say Caesar, I know there's a video called Caesar's Messiah and all this stuff, but <clears throat> Caesar represents Rome. Rome and Christianity got married. Okay. You can't deny that. Paul was a Roman. You can't deny that. Okay. How can we be sure Rome is a suspect in Daniel 7.25? Daniel 7.3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The four beasts are described. Rome has details that the others do not. So let's see. <clears throat> Romans, Romans 13, 1 through 7. Remember when I asked, who got their own book in the New Testament? The Romans. Then we talk about taxpayers, right? For because of this, you also pay taxes. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Who was the governing, governing authority when this was written? For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. You think the church didn't use this? You think the Romans didn't use this? In their book? Come on. They probably wouldn't. I don't know why it took, you know, until like the fourth century for them to like convert to Christianity completely, but. Um, maybe they wouldn't read this or they wouldn't fill in it on. And maybe they were just steeped in their own religions, but man. It's a, it's a wonder why they didn't read this out the gate. Like, yep, that's us. For rulers are not a terror to good works. For rulers are not a terror to good works. So the Inquisitions, right? <clears throat> but to evil, do you want to be, <clears throat> do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. But to them, that's going along with the gospel, right? Because if you don't, you're cursed. For he is God's minister to you for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He does not bear the sword in vain. Esau will live by his sword, y'all. Remember that. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. You keep the law. 
something's wrong with you. You've fallen from grace if you keep the Torah, right? Doesn't the New Testament say that? Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for con conscience sake. Excuse me. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Sound like Jesus, right? Render Caesar's things unto Caesar's. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So, this is why Rome is the major suspect when changing times and laws. Their name just keeps coming up. It's all over the place. And their actions. It's not just the name. It's what they have done. And they got their own book, y'all, in the New Testament. How ironic. Daniel, he, he, he gave us the game. It was different from all the beasts. Daniel 7, 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before, and it had ten horns. We know the Romans... You know, Esau, let's let's back it up because this is really Esau going on, right? Edom. Edom morphs. Read uh Psalm 83. It says, the tents of Edom. He's got, you know, he's got tentacles all over the place. He morphs, he changes. Daniel 7 19. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with his teeth of iron and his nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. This is a hideous monster, right? It's a beast. Now, the fourth kingdom. Why do we know that Rome is the fourth kingdom? Daniel 7, 23. Then he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces. Daniel 7, 24, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after the, after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Many, many commentaries on this, many different opinions, right? But who is the main focus on these beasts? The description seems to be drawn from Rome, not my opinion. Vincent Commentary, the ten horns or kingdoms were to arise out of the dissolution of the Roman Empire, which came to pass accordingly. Vincent Commentary, Revelation 17, 9. Anyone with wisdom can figure this out. The seven heads that the woman is sitting on stand for seven hills. These heads are also seven kings. Ellicott's Commentary for English Readers, the description seems to be drawn from Rome, the seven-hilled city, this keeps the reference to Rome before us. The description seems to be drawn from Rome. Ellicott's commentary for English readers. I didn't write that. The Britannica. Seven hills of Rome. Seven hills of Rome. Group of hills on or about which the ancient city of Rome was built. There are many opinions on these verses, but to keep it simple, we can see Rome is a constant feature in all the commentaries. Rome and Paul. Rome and Paul. Titus, Paul, Rome. Titus, Paul, and Rome. Constantly come up when you're talking about changing the times and the laws. So, this was part three of Daniel warning us about Christianity. We will see you next time for which probably should be the conclusion. So, with that being said, shalom and thanks for listening.